Uh, I was gazellig. Gazellig, all right. Oh, that's a very good word. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, Mark. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. And um, yeah, I, I know you as a software toolsmith and I, I know you from one of the godfathers behind Macromedia, if I may say it like that, and uh, the, the person uh, behind, uh, behind Istigate IE. Um, so, so how long are you actually in, uh, in the trade, in the market now? For quite some years, isn't it? Yeah, um, <laughs> so I was doing software uh, in uh, New York City okay. in 1980. 1980. So that's 40 years. Okay. okay. And then I moved to Chicago and worked for Bally Midway. I made video games. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And I worked on Spy Hunter. Spy so Hunter. if you know Spy Hunter. <laughs> So this is the first licensed music for video game wow. ever. Okay. Wow. And I did I did the music. Okay. Oh wow. And I, uh, I wish I could have your signature, but that's a bit difficult now. And that's 1983. And All then right. we heard about this new computer coming. It was called the Macintosh. Woo! And so we were one of the first developers to ever develop for the Macintosh. And and, and, and are you? All right, and, and, and being an uh, open source uh, uh, advocate, I would say, if, if I may say you are open source advocate? Yes, I've done a lot of open source. In fact, I contributed to Drupal 3. Drupal 3, all right, wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I flew over to Bruges, and I met Dries, and I drank some very strong uh, Belgium beer. Delirium? Did you drink I delirium? Remember. I think it was the elephant beer. Yeah, that's remember. delirium. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly yeah. the one. Well, it's a good thing yeah. that you're already able to remember that part. Yes. and uh, It must have so been at Fosdem then, then. I've watched Acquia grow. I'm so proud of Dries and the company oh, wow. making good money, you know, <laughs> showing that open source can make money. And so that's all very good. Yeah, well, that's that's what a lot of companies are trying to do now, right? Making money with open source. All right. So um, now, uh, how do you want to go? Do you want me to start presenting, or what do you yes. want me to do? I would love to hear what you have for us today. So please. And by the way, the I'm going to go over to the stage. It's 158 people still are there. So I want to thank all you 158 people for staying for the end. I know it's been a long day. You know. It's so been I'm a long day, but guy. thank you, Earl, everyone. And uh, Mark, please take the stage. Okay, here we go. I'm going to start presenting, okay? Yes. Here we go. All right, so I'm going to present my whole screen here. And uh, all right, so first of all, here's my bookshelf, you know. Yeah, it's uh, And so again, bookshelf. can you hear me? Yeah, we can still hear you. I have no feedback at all. Is this working? I should just, I'm going to go back one more time. It works. Okay, great. So I can it just works. talk and, and everybody understands it. And you will come in and interrupt me if anyone has a question or anything, yep. right? We have some moderators. So if something happens, I'll try to uh, interfere on the, uh, if that doesn't happen, well, it will happen, but I might wait yes. till the end of the talk to uh, have some questions for you. Well, what I'll do is, I think what I want to do is I want to go back and forth. Oh, Is that possible? okay. Right, so like now you see my head. Yes. Right, and then I can go back and say, "Well, but as I was just saying," and then yep. I'll go back to the presentation. Right. Excellent. And go back and forth. Okay. Yeah, the technology works. Go ahead. All right. All right. Wonderful. Well, welcome everybody to the <laughs> world-changing realities of software keynote. Closing up. Oh, DrupalCon. Oh, it's not DrupalCon. It's Drupal Jam, right? So I better fix that right now. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> fix that. See, we're not afraid of uh, showing that we are humans and that we are trying to do things. And I'm going to talk about three themes here. Creativity, making money, and learning. Okay? This is the three themes that are going to lead us to the future of the software business, okay? So I'm trying to set some context 
on the past, which will then make us understand the future, right? Okay, so we start off with creativity software. And this is the software that my company built. And, you know, uh, this software was used by anybody. You didn't have to be a programmer. Uh, in those days, we called it authoring. Programming is when you use a programming language. But if you use a tool, we call that authoring. Okay, and these tools were very important. So every time there'd be a new technology, you'd have to have a new tool. And so, for instance, there was a tool called PageMaker, and you get PageMaker to be able to do desktop publishing. And then there was a tool called Word or WordPerfect, and this was used to do uh, editing text. And the same thing was true with our tool. It was called VideoWorks. And eventually, we evolved it into a, product, a name called Director. And Director was the tool that you use to build multimedia. Okay, And the key thing here was that we were getting people to learn how to use the tool themselves. As they talk about Jesus and you know the future of humanity, you don't just give someone the fish. You teach them how to fish. And I know this is something I don't have to tell Dutch people about. Okay. Now, from this uh, tool came a whole new range of things. And see, my company, we didn't even imagine what you could do with our tool, right? We were all video game guys. And so we're thinking of all these kind of crazy video games. But then it was our customers who showed us multimedia presentations, scientific visualizations, all these different things you could do with our tools, okay? And what happened was that you could become a professional tool user and you could make money by using the tool. What a concept, you know? Now, as this evolution, this uh, era grew, this is all before the web. And the big, the first thing that we needed to be able to do multimedia was have a storage medium. Now, I don't know how many of you all know about a company called Philips, but in Philips, they were one of the people who developed optical disk storage. Okay, it's a very important thing. And maybe some of your parents worked at Philips. Maybe some of you are old people out there and you worked at Philips. And I want to thank you for the optical disk. At the time, we could store 600 megabytes of data on one of these shiny disks. And the other thing that happened around this time was that there was a standard called the Multimedia PC. And this standard said you have to have 640 by 480 graphics. It had to be eight bits of color resolution. You had to have eight bit audio and you had to have this thing which was called a CD-ROM, okay? And all this technology was evolving. In fact, let me tell you a quick story. There was a standard called MPEG, okay? So MPEG was 640 by 480 and very low resolution, what we would call low resolution nowadays. And so they tested it and they created this whole standard called MPEG and they showed it to the customers. And the customer said, well, wait a minute, this doesn't look that much better than VHS videotape. Well, I thought this was the future. I thought this was optical storage. So they had to go back and they created MPEG-2. And that was the format that had higher resolution, but they realized, oh, we can't launch a new standard and call it MPEG-2. So they decided to rename it DVD. Okay, so that's how the DVD standard came out and it came into the consumer world. Now, these physical discs, these optical discs, were distributed via what we call a two tier distribution system. So, somebody like me, we would manufacture the discs and we would go to the middlemen. The middlemen would purchase 5,000, 10,000 boxes, they'd store it in their warehouse. And then they would go to the retailers and the retailers would purchase the software from them. And so by the time the software got into the retail shop, 
it was really all about what we call the shelf space. How much room is there in the retail shop for each software product, okay? Now, Microsoft figured this out. And what they did was they went to all the retailers and they said, we're gonna purchase, you know, like 30% of your retail space. And so this space on your shelf, that's the Microsoft zone. And you can't put any other product into this area, but our product, okay? So this whole kind of archaic old school system was one of the reasons why the CD-ROMs failed. And by the way, this is these images here are from a CD-ROM that I did at that time called the Media Band, okay? All right, so what happened with our software industry? How did we get beyond this problem of the two-tier distribution system? The web! Bum, 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 bum. Yes, this is where I go back and I say, yes, ladies and gentlemen, the web was very important. I, luckily, I don't have to tell you that. But for me, a software guy, the web was a big deal. And, and I should say, I was coming to Amsterdam since 1975. And I had many friends in Amsterdam. And I met some guys that worked for a company called Excess for All. Okay, you might, some of you might know of that company. So I was in Amsterdam during the early days of the web. And let me tell you, it was all about getting access to the internet. So then all of a sudden, there was all these different um, shops that we would go and they all be filled up with uh, computers, and that was how we would all get access to the internet. Okay, so now we've got the web. Now, remember, I'm a media guy. Okay, and for me, the web kind of went backwards, right? We didn't have video, we didn't have high res photos, we only had very low res because we're sip sipping on the data as if we're sipping through a thin straw. It wasn't very much data, okay? And so we couldn't have photos or videos and stuff. So to me, it was kind of like we went backwards and we threw out the baby with the bathwater, okay? All right, now, but the good news was that the web brought us online electronic distribution, and that's great. But it took almost 10 years before what the web was could equal what we had with a CD-ROM, okay? It was around 2005, that's when YouTube came along, uh, but now I'm jumping ahead. Um, so meanwhile, another thing that happened, and this is a key thing to understand the software industry, is that a lot of money came into the situation, okay? Money breeds evil, breeds corruption, and this is what happened to software companies, that at the time, as you saw, my company, we had like six or eight products. But when the web came along, all of a sudden, a software company only has one product, okay? And the venture capitalists and Wall Street and all the money people, they came in and very much corrupted the industry. Now, this led to what we call the dot bomb. Of, what, uh, of the industry, okay? And by the way, the first downturn I had that I went through was in 1989, uh, where my company was trying to go public and uh, there was a downturn. And so Macromedia could not go public until 1993, okay? And this held it up, okay? Because of the downturn in the economy. Well, right about 1998, 99, this whole dot bomb thing was going along. This is a screenshot from a product called The Globe, okay? And these people were rushing to IPO, rushing to the market. The products weren't finished. They certainly were not profitable. And so what we had was a collapse of the whole industry and yet another downturn. And I call this downturn 2.0, okay? And I have a theory of how all this happened. Uh, one was that at the same time during the 90s, there was also something called Y2K, okay? This is the notion that the computers were all going to stop working on January 1st, 2000. So throughout the 90s, everyone was crying like what we say, chicken little, okay?
okay? The sky is falling. The sky is falling. You have to go buy a new computer. Oh, no. Y2K is, is crashing. Y2K is going to crash. And so the tech industry during the 90s grew at 35% growth year to year. That's a lot of money. And Bill Gates had predicted that there will be a computer on every desktop. Now, back in the 80s, that seemed crazy. But in the 90s, it increasingly became more and more. And, of course, your computer came along with something called a modem. So you could attach to the Internet, which meant that you needed to have Internet access, which then led to a whole infrastructure play and big screens and more graphics and CD-ROMs and video. And just the whole thing grew more and more. Okay, And what that led to was a whole insider's game uh, and a startup ecosystem. So I saw this ecosystem happening in Holland, in uh, uh, Germany, in Berlin, in London, in down in Italy, and throughout the U.S. Okay, and, and then it also happened in Tokyo and China as well. So the end of the 90s led to... Uh, January 1st, 2000. And everyone looked around and went, well, the sky didn't fall. So if that was a scam, maybe this whole dot-com thing is a scam too. So if you track the evolution of this downturn, the height of the dot-com era was Q1 of 2000. And after that, everything started going downhill. And there was a diaspora that happened to all the techies who had come from around the world. They all had come to Silicon Valley to get rich uh, during the dot-com era. But when dot-com was over and we were in downturn 2.0, well, all of a sudden, everybody went home. Everybody moved back to Dusseldorf and Shanghai and Singapore and Tel Aviv and you know austin texas and all of a sudden there was a dispersal and all these techies spread throughout the world all right so the bad news is that a lot of money was lost a lot of speculation was lost but you don't have to cry for the rich people they're fine uh but what happened was that all this technical expertise went home and they took their expertise with them and that led to web 2.0. And so all of a sudden, we have a whole new set of things. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. But I want to tell you one story that I remember from this era. Okay. And so I'm standing in line at some store. And these people are talking about a Bob Dylan concert that they downloaded the recording of the concert. So this wasn't a Bob Dylan album you know, listening to the CD, or, you know, this is something that was alternative. This was a recording that had been uploaded into Napster. And these people are talking about these different versions of the song. That's what Bob Dylan liked to do. He'd sing the same songs, but he would perform them differently with different arrangements. And this blew their mind. And what blew my mind was, Oh my God, Napster is changing the music business. No longer is it limited to just the official releases, the official albums. Now, every live concert, every alternative version of the song, every independent band can directly upload into Napster and we can all share. And that blew my mind. Okay. But I have to tell you, uh, this was just the beginning of blowing my mind. Okay, so now I'm going to climb out of sharing and go back to live. And say, All right, so here I am emphasizing to you how important Web 2.0 was. All right, because now the browsers are faster. The computers are faster. There was something called jQuery. By the way, this is right when Drupal was born, and I was contributing to Drupal. And so all of a sudden, you have these technologists who were all in Silicon Valley. They're now scattered around the world. We have faster bandwidth. 
we have a whole new categories of software and things are really starting to change. And oh, by the way, as our previous speaker just mentioned, we had this thing called open source. So all these factors come together and now we're really starting to change things, right? Now we're really starting to say, well, wait a minute, maybe search isn't just some stupid little thing. Maybe search is like a really big thing. Of course, that became Google. And Amazon is saying, yes, buy through online, buy through online. And what we've seen with COVID recently is the acceleration of this to the point where all the retail commerce is going away and everything is going through online. Okay, And the evolution of creative expression, of blogging, and there was a technical uh, subscription model called RSS. This changed the, the ability for a creative person to directly publish their content onto the web, route around the mainstream media, okay? And of course, that has led to Twitter and Facebook posting and a whole revolution here. Now, the Drupal folks, you helped establish a standard called CMS, Content Management System. You weren't the only ones. There was a guy named Matt Mullenweg. And he did this thing called WordPress, okay? And so the combination of WordPress and Drupal, this is what has built the web. These are where all the websites are. But again, you're not the only people doing that. There was this whole thing called Salesforce and NetSuite and SAP and all these software companies that decided, hmm, software is kind of interesting. Maybe we can use it for business. Right. And then along comes Mark Zuckerberg and MySpace and they're going, hey, let's go hang out with each other and be all social and shit, you know, and then Federated ID and streaming media and all these things come together. And these are all the new kinds of software that were made possible during Web 2.0. Well, what was also going on was there's this guy named Tim Berners-Lee. Now, you know, just like you don't write the word God, you don't type G-O-D. You go G underscore D. It's bad luck to write God. Well, it's the same way with Tim Berners-Lee. We don't write out the word Tim Berners-Lee. We go T space B hyphen L. Okay? Now, so Tim Berners-Lee is God. And whatever he says will happen. All right? Because he invented the web. Right? So what he did was he gave us the promise of this thing called the semantic web. And what the semantic web said was, we're not going to simply organize our data in a hierarchy of a category and a subcategory. That's called XML. No, we're going to organize our data in triples. And we're going to create relationships between the data. The car, the man drives the car. Okay, so that in the data itself is the relationships of subject, predicate, and object. Okay, now this became an underground intellectual movement. I remember going to Amsterdam and meeting with these people, Galway, Ireland, and on all these forums and mail lists. And I was part of this kind of revolutionary group. In fact, uh, today's uh, event is called Reboot. I was going to Copenhagen to a conference called Reboot. <laughs> Some of you might have gone to that. And in this revolutionary new approach, semantic encoding, tagging, big data, and what we call NLPs, natural language processing, this all came out of the effort of the semantic web. Unfortunately, the semantic web did not hit mainstream, at least not in these early days. Okay. But what did hit mainstream is the notion that these users are data. Oh, my God. Social networking, targeted advertising, SEO, all this stuff came up during the, the, what we call the aughts. Okay? And this is when technology became big money. The kind of revenues that Google was creating, that Facebook was creating, the targeted advertising, what they call ad tech, all this money got the notice of all the rest of the money. Okay. And so that led us to 
yet another downturn, okay, downturn 3.0, which is when all the speculation of the money was tied into real estate. And you got companies like Lehman Brothers going out of business, AIG almost going bankrupt, and a global downturn in 07 to 09 that almost put everybody out of business. Well, that's where, in fact, the Obama administration came in and helped uh, resurrect our economy. And what came out of it was a whole new model for how technology and software fits in with society. Okay, so again, I'm going to go off of my sharing for a second to emphasize to you this next turn of events. Okay, so here we are in um, uh, downturn 3.0. Okay, and all these new technologies are now being proven to Wall Street. There's big money there. Am I running out of time? Oh no, he's talking. Okay, sorry. All right. So <laughs> I thought he was talking to me. Okay, so. Um, uh, so now we got big money, okay? And this whole new startup ecosystem came along. And what they did was they made it so that angel investors had a win-win situation. It didn't matter whether you placed a bet, maybe $10,000, $20,000 on 50 different companies, okay? And all those investments uh, were guaranteed to be successful. Why? Because either your investment in the software company was successful and you made money from the investment, or if you lost money, you could take that and substitute it from the taxes that you owe. And so all, this, uh, all these investments were guaranteed to be a win-win, and that no matter what, all these, devel all these investors would make money from their investments. Well, that then lead to creating a whole bubble, all right? This win-win approach. So the software ecosystem grew. In, in Holland, there was a conference called Picnic. Then there was, I was uh, working with a conference called Emers down in Rotterdam. There was a conference called The Next Web, right? Boris and Patrick. And so all of a sudden, this ecosystem with all these startups started growing. And what fed that is what I call buzzword du jour mentality. Whether it's AI or blockchain or edtech or martech or VR, all these buzzwords then get associated with startups. The startups then promote this new technology. The startup ecosystem comes in and invests into these companies. And what is everybody looking for? FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. What's the next big thing, okay? Now, in parallel to all this ecosystem, another major thing is going on in the evolution of software is what we now call digital transformation because there was a guy named Mark Andreessen. And what he said was, well, look, I appreciate the fact that there's a software industry and that there are software companies and software investments. But software now is mainstream. Software is used in every different kind of company. All companies are software companies. Okay, So this led to a whole lot of change in our society. The power of Facebook and Twitter has now created this era of social computing where one's reputation and credibility, uh, their social capital, the means of getting these messages out through the internet influencers are spreading. And governments themselves are becoming tools of misinformation because of the power of social networking. I don't have to tell you what Trump virus does over here. And he just goes onto Twitter and lies. And it, that's not illegal. I mean, to me, that they should throw Trump in jail just for that, okay? And the key thing to all this is to follow the money. Wherever the money goes, that's where it's going to affect the software business. Now, the other thing that was going on in this era is there's been this phenomena called the AI winter, okay? And AI winter is when the, the researchers make a promise 
oh yes, AI will do, be able to do this. And, and then they get all this money, typically from government. And they work for five or 10 years and they fail. So then all the funding dries up and then they come back another 10 years later and say, oh, well, now AI is going to be able to do that. And they made all these promises. And this happened over and over again until around 2012. Now they make a promise and they say, well, AI will be able to do this. And now everyone believes them. <laughs> and we're in the midst of yet another hype cycle with AI. Okay. And this, by the way, is where it ties in the semantic web, because a lot of these RDF graphs and the notion of a graph database ties in. I don't know how technical you guys are out there, but the, the graph database is a very important part of semantic encoding. Semantic encoding is a very important part of AI. Okay. Now, there's been a bunch of other things that's happened because of this AI explosion. One is that we don't have one internet anymore, okay? We have at least three, if not more, completely separate internets that will interact with each other, but can also stand alone. We have a phrase that everyone likes to talk about, which is that data is the new oil. And so I like to ask, well, if data is the new oil, what are the algorithms? What's the metaphor for that? And during recently, when Trump tried to force TikTok to be sold, the Chinese government said, no, you can't export that algorithm. And this is what's fueling the Cold War 2.0 is the status of the algorithms. All right, so we're now in a bubble we've never seen before. This is the bubble that refuses to burst because digital transformation keeps technology in the mainstream, which means that there will be a constant desire for new technology. Now, yes, uh, Microsoft and Facebook and Salesforce and all these companies are coming in, Amazon, and they're dominating. They're creating most of the money, but there still seems to be a lot of money left over for other people. Uh, among other things, we were talking about open source. There's also a new thing called crowdfunding where a software company like mine can go directly to the customers and get money, okay? And we're starting to see the hegemony and the power of Silicon Valley be dispersed. And as these tech hubs are growing, whether it's Austin, Texas, or Singapore, or Shanghai, or you know Tel Aviv, uh, we're starting to see Silicon Valley no longer be the only place that technology can grow, okay? And to me, this is where the networks of the networking are interconnecting together, this kind of distributed, decentralized world, okay? And of course, we help, this is helpful because we're carrying around in our pockets a supercomputer, okay? And to me, that's pretty amazing. And it's because there's so much cash out there that we're now seeing that software is the new rock and roll, okay? The, the most envious job, the job that my daughter wants more than anything else, but all her friends want to do, they want to be internet influencers, right? That's the new rock and roll. That's what people want to do. They want to get paid to post on Instagram and TikTok. Right? That is like their perfect scenario. What a job. Can you imagine? And so just go out on the street and talk to any young person about this. And that's clearly what they really love to do. Okay. All right. So here we are. Uh, now, what the hell's going on now? Like, what, why am I even watching this speech? You know? Okay. So what I like to do is I want to point you to the 2005 Steve Jobs commencement speech in Stanford. And where he talks about connecting the dots. He talks about stay hungry, stay foolish. And he talks about find what you love. And don't settle for anything less. Okay? So this is very inspirational words uh, from a leader of our industry. I'll point you to that and I'll say, each of you are on your own journey. And we get to decide collectively uh, what our future is. Then there's this guy named Jeff Bezos. You might have heard of him at this point. He's the world's richest man. And he has three tenets, three philosophies in life. One. The customer comes first, 
Always keep innovating and have patience, all right? So here's my summary for software in the future. Software is a very powerful tool, but uh, it's making a lot of, a few people rich, okay? And that's really the problem. Is software about changing the world or is software about making people rich, okay? The second is that AI will be in all software. Now, to do AI, it's really hard. It's really expensive. And the data really matters, okay? And in this startup ecosystem, uh, that's great. And it's wonderful that there's this infinite bubble. But it's not like there's an infinite number of good ideas, right? And so there is a conflict there. Yes, people can always be creative and express themselves. But that doesn't mean that your startup is going to succeed. In fact, the odds are actually against you. Now, I do have some bad news for you all. It turns out that there are evil people in the world. You know, We had hoped that this recent election would change that, that all the good people would rise up and get rid of the bad people. And I think you've seen it in Europe with Brexit and what's going on in different countries, in Hungary and uh austria that the oh and then also in poland they just uh you know put the laws against abortion and so you find that there are still evil people out there and they use software too right so here's one thing i know for sure opportunism contrarian thinking and magic will still be there no matter what and software can change the world so a real quickie on me, uh, here's me at the Sound Garden in 2007. Like I said, I've been coming to Holland a long time. I've been on a long journey myself, creating software the whole time. Here I am, I moved to Cleveland in 2009 to try to create jobs for people because I felt it was important to take technology and try to apply it to people who aren't necessarily uh, being uh, Taken and taken, uh, taken care of. This guy right here is an ex felon. He uh, came out of prison. Okay. I've gone to a lot of trade shows. I've gotten really bored. Okay. So it became a meme that people would photograph me falling asleep all around the world because I was there at the conference and I'm falling asleep. Okay. So, what are the persistent themes that's going on here? that we have to keep creating, we have to keep creating software, we have to keep inventing new kinds of software, okay? And we have to focus on going from zero to one to take that moment where the idea becomes a product. That's very important. And we always want to be learning, okay? And we lead by example, by having principles in our life and relationships. And so that's what's happening in my life. Here I am at the Macintosh 30th anniversary. I was one of the first Mac developers. Here I am with Louis Lemur, if some of you know who that is. Uh, relationships. The world is a big place and the web brings us together. And a key thing is that the techies, we have to bring value uh, to society, but more than just money. It's not just about making money because software can change the world. And may I point out to you that us humans, we get to control the AI, not the other way around. So here I am with a bunch of friends. That's Doug Engelbart. Uh, that's uh, Dave McClure and Dave Morin. There's a guy named Ed Williams up here, uh, my friend Robert Scoble. Robert rented a bus. We all went to Vegas together. This is David Bunnell, who started Macworld Magazine, and a guy named Dave Weiner, who invented RSS and one of the first bloggers. So these are the people I hang out with. And oh, by the way, my company, uh, we have got a, a new model for conversational storytelling. And just like we helped the world of multimedia, so will we also help the world of AI. And uh, yeah, blah, 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 software publishing, blah, blah, blah. Yes, yes, yes. But the key thing here is that you know we are not promoting the fact that Skynet will come and take over the world. We are an anti-AI company, okay? We are pointing out to you that there's a man standing behind the curtain, and he is pulling the levers and turning the wheel, right? And we know who that guy is. He thinks he's a wizard. He's trying to convince us he's a wizard, but we know different, right? And what we're going to do is teach people how to become wizards, right? So that's who we are.
And that's what I'm up to. Jean-Paul Vossman. Hey, Mark, can you hear me? Go up mute. Hello, Mark. Can't hear anybody. Yeah, yeah, now we can hear you. Emil Brock calling yeah. and Mark. How are you there? Hey, Mark, can you hear hello. me? Hey, hello. Hey, hello. Hey, Mark, that's really awesome. Uh, when I listen to you talk, you're obviously a, a visionaire. Um, but what I'm wondering if... Uh, Open source did not exist. So let's say Linus Torvalds and um, uh, other important people in the open source world from the early days, 1991, uh, around that time, did not meet each other. Um, where do you think that the IT world, the software world, would have been if open source was not invented? Well, you know, I know some of the people who invented open source. Um, I'm good friends with a guy named John Gilmore, mm -hmm. and he invented GNU, G-N-U, right? And uh, he was one of the original employees at Sun Micro. And so I've been watching open source all along the way. I'm good friends with a woman named Kim Palais. She's a woman who named Java and oh. then created Marimba, which is one of the first Java companies, and then did a whole Java lamp stack company in the aughts. And so I've watched the evolution of open source, whether yeah. it is Word, WordPress or Drupal, and I've seen, and Red Hat, of course, and it has shown that creating a balance between the capitalists and private closed and having an open approach is very important. But may I point out to you that open source isn't the only kind of open nowadays, okay? Let, let me just bring up three or four that affect me. Like, so I'm not going to give you my open source source code, okay? Mm -hmm. But I'm going to have APIs so that you can plug in your software into my platform. I'm going to have an open data format so that you can build your own data modules and ways that your software can interface to my software, okay? Um, I'm going to have an open platform so that uh, you as a developer can create and make a living building tools and other things with our software and somebody else's software, all right? So the perfect world is that you don't want to have to write the software that somebody else has written. Exactly. What you want to do is use that software and put together your own software. Yeah. All right. All right. So all these are not necessarily open source, but they are the world of open software. Right. There's a lot of different ways to be open. Yeah, of, of course. Uh, open standards, maybe uh, advanced yeah. open standards, what you're more talking about than open source software then. Exactly. But, but still my question you were obviously a visionary. You've been there from the early days. Where do you think that the uh, innovation of software would have been without open source? Well, dude, I mean, it's like saying, what happens if uh, Nixon had never resigned? Yeah. Right? We could, we'd still be stuck with Nixon. You know, I mean, like, you know, my speculation as a futurist yeah. is always to, to be optimistic and positive. Okay. Okay. If we wouldn't have had open source, we'd be fucked. Okay, I'm sorry <laughs> to use bad words, you know, but I don't think of the negative, horrible things that society could have been. I look at all the wonderful things that society is and what we can do with society. Yeah, but I'm positive as well, and therefore I like to sometimes uh, look back and see how uh, graduate week can be that open source has been invented and that it's actually now uh, the, the majority of uh, software and uh, the, the power of software is because the, uh, the software is open source. Of, uh, you By mentioned the way, Linux. I, let, me, let me ask you this. Let me, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay, yeah, okay? go ahead. If you're talking about the philosophy of open source. Yeah. Are you aware of a new movement called inner source? No, I'm not. Please 
Okay, like good. So I get to educate you. Yeah, All please. Right, so about about twenty years ago, yeah, Tim O Tim O'Reilly, yeah, okay, he said, "Well, I understand that open source is very positive, but this is all outside the enterprise firewall." Yeah, and once you go inside the enterprise firewall, it's all very locked down, very proprietary, very controlled. And so for 20 years, Tim has talked, and I am a, a good friend, and uh, on my board of directors, a mm -hmm. woman named Denise Cooper. Okay? Now, Denise is now in Ireland, and she is part of a team that's developed a, um, a whole approach to inner source that will bring the principles of open source inside the corporate firewall. All so right. um, we're sharing, we've got repositories. They're yeah. working with both GitHub and GitLab, okay? And a lot of major companies, SAP, Microsoft, Google, et cetera, all these companies are all starting to experiment and use the principles of open source, but apply it inside the proprietary firewall of the enterprise world. And so mm. perhaps... Uh, maybe some of your people out there, I don't know how many are still watching. Let me go check the number here. You still have 139 people that are Hello. still watching. Okay. And so maybe some of those people uh, will take the principle, go type in and search for inner source. Inner source. And how okay. inner source can help bring the principle of open source inside of Philips, Elsevier, KPN, and like all these big, large companies. They could also benefit from inner source. But, but what, what I don't understand about that inner source concept, what you just told, is that open source is already in, in enterprises. Like the company I work for, SUSE, and uh, yeah. you mentioned other open source, uh, big open source enterprise companies as well. well but dude, so what's the difference? You know, you know there's a thing called intellectual property, right? Yeah. Right? Okay, so, okay, so it's one thing if you're Red Hat, or Acquia, or a company that's based around open source software. Yeah. But that's not what, who SAP is. That's nope. not who a bank is. That's not who an insurance company is. Okay. So they can use these things called open source software. But we're talking about an in inner source is the principle of how ideas are shared. Okay. How do people cooperate and work together? And so my friend Denise has written... Uh, more than one book on this. They have think tanks and they are studying the effect of this. They've been doing research for five, seven years now, being able to quantify this is people that are closed. These are people who are open. Okay. That's really what we're talking about here. Don't get hung up in the dogma of this kind of license and this uh -huh. kind of thing, and a very specific definition of open source. Inner source is where we now apply it more at the global concept of sharing, of openness at all. Because remember, the way corporations were run, are still being run, is very yeah. closed-minded. It's very controlled. And that's what inner source is about. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. I absolutely learned something here, for sure. There is you there go. One there you book? go. Well, now we got a balance. See, yeah, yeah. If it would not have been an online event, I'm sure we would have been closing the bar late at night uh, talking over uh, the, the philosophy of uh, software. May I point out one thing? Yes, please. Since I was telling you the story of going to Belgium and drinking the strong alcohol, right? Okay. Yep. You know how alcohol affects your body? Um, I've got some ideas. It kills the brain cells in your mind, in your brain. Okay. That's what alcohol literally does. That's what happens when you get drunk. That your brain cells are being killed. Okay. Marijuana <laughs> does not kill brain cells. Marijuana is a natural herb and they created a racist prohibition because black people were the ones who were smoking it. And we are just now coming out of 80-year prohibition where the medical profession was prevented from doing research on the benefits of cannabis and marijuana. And we now here in the U.S., especially in the state of California, we're yep. able to prove 
that marijuana is actually good for you. So no, my <laughs> friend, I am not going to some bar drinking alcohol, killing my brain cells. I am going to the coffee house. My favorite one's called the Gray Area. It's on the the U de Lillistrat. Okay, the, and that's Lillistrat, why I'm going to okay. rauchen the kefir. Right, I'm going to smoke the joints, and I'm going to get healthy. All right, what a recommendation we get here at uh, at Drupal Gym. Sorry, I don't know if we're oh, still yeah. on air, but I am having a good oh, time. Yeah. I'm having a good time. I don't really mind. Hey, but uh, Mark, uh, I really yeah. would like to thank you, and uh, I please a big round of applause. And has, is this all been recorded? Do we have it on recording? <laughs> no, 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 no. Nothing is recorded. Good. <laughs> Good, because then I want to share it. I want to take my little thing and I want to do my little post and I'm going to go into LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook Woo! and I'm going to spread the vibe of Drupal. Very good. Um, <laughs> hey, Mark, thank you so much. Uh, great to have you. Hopefully next time we'll be able to invite you over to come physically to Rotterdam. And um, yeah, yeah. Um, Thanks again, and uh, love to see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. Uh.